when anything moves, it uses up energy, and that energy has to come from somewhere. Motor vehicles need fuel, petrol or diesel fuel. Animals, including people, need fuel as well. And that's what this film's all about. So let's start with a motor car engine. The fuel it needs is petrol. So much petrol will produce so much energy. Drive the car hard and fast, and the petrol gets used up quickly. Drive more cautiously, and the petrol will last longer. What happens to the petrol? How does it get used up? Well, petrol burns easily, and in a motor car engine, that's just what happens to it. It's pumped from the tank to the carburetor, where it's mixed with air and burnt up, and it's this which produces the energy to drive the car. It's just the same for us, that we take in our fuel in the form of the food which we eat. Inside us, it's burnt up to produce energy to keep us alive. But unlike, say, a motor car, young animals have to grow, and they need other foods as well for bodybuilding food that their bodies can use to build bone and muscle and tissue. Even a fully grown animal needs these bodybuilding foods for running repairs, so that worn out parts can be replaced like the surface of the skin, for instance. Our energy foods, our fuels, are called carbohydrates. Sugar's pure carbohydrate and provides a lot of energy when it's burnt inside the body. Sugary, starchy things like cakes also provide energy, and so do potatoes. Fats, like butter and lard, can be stored in the body, then turned into fuel when needed. Meat provides protein. When we eat lean meat or poultry or fish, we're eating the animal's muscles, and our bodies turn the proteins they contain into the right protein for our own bodies. Proteins are the bodybuilding substances. There are proteins, too, in milk and eggs, in cheese and bread, as well as traces of other necessary substances like calcium for bones and certain vitamins. Fresh vegetables contain important minerals and vitamins, and sometimes protein, for example in peas. Fruit is a good source of some vitamins, as well as of other things. What happens to our food when we eat it? This is a model of the human digestive tract, the long tube which passes right through our bodies. Food goes first of all into the mouth, where it's chewed up and softened with saliva. Then it passes down the food pipe, the esophagus, to the stomach. We can see what happens when we swallow by x-raying someone as he drinks what's called a barium meal. This milky stuff contains a substance which is opaque to x-rays, so it shows up as a dark shadow as it passes through the body. Watch it go down. Food doesn't just fall down the esophagus by gravity. The pipe has muscular walls which squeeze the stuff down. Watch its sudden squeezes as Colin swallows. The esophagus passes through a hole in the diaphragm at the bottom of the chest into the stomach. You can see Colin's stomach filling up. Let's have a look at the stomach and see what it does. It's a sort of bag. The food coming into it from the mouth has already been softened by chewing, and the saliva has started to change it chemically. More chemical changes go on inside the stomach. We can find out what goes on inside using a human volunteer. Gareth has swallowed a long plastic tube which goes right down into his stomach, and we're drawing off any liquid that's inside. It's not too bad if a doctor who knows how to do it helps you swallow the tube. Now, Gareth hasn't eaten or drunk anything for 12 hours, so this isn't something he's swallowed. It's gastric juice, a liquid which is secreted into the stomach through its walls. 
acid, and at this stage, it's nearly clear and colourless. Now Gareth eats something, some thin bread and butter. A bit difficult with that chew going down the throat, but it can be done. We're going to see what happens to this food inside his stomach. When it gets there, it will meet the gastric juices. After a quarter of an hour or so, something's happened. You can see that the liquid coming from Gareth's stomach looks different. It's cloudier and coloured greeny-yellow. The gastric juices have started to dissolve parts of the food, and at the same time they're turning certain things in the food into chemical substances useful to the body. You can see that there certainly has been a chemical change if you compare the gastric juice now with what it looked like before there was any food for it to react with. And here's another experiment. We take some of that unused gastric juice and put a bit of raw minced beef into it. Now, inside the body, the liquid would be warm, so we have to put the mixture in an incubator at body temperature for about 12 hours. Now look at it. The beef looks different. It's gone paler around the edges. Digestion has gone on, just as it would have done inside the human body. So that's what goes on in the stomach. Some of the food gets dissolved by the gastric juices and chemical changes take place. This takes an hour or two from the time we eat. Then the stomach empties its contents into the next part of the digestive tract. At the exit end of the stomach, there's a tight ring of muscle called the pylorus. And when this muscle relaxes, the ring loosens and other muscles in the stomach walls squeeze the partly digested food through into the duodenum. In this model, Part of the walls of the duodenum have been cut away so that you can see inside. Here some very important new chemical substances get added to the stuff that's come from the stomach. This big sausage-shaped organ is called the pancreas. It produces more digestive juices which pass into the duodenum to mix with the food. Another liquid called bile, produced by the liver, is stored in the gallbladder underneath the liver. The bile, too, passes into the duodenum. Its job is to help with the digestion of the fat we eat. So now the food's in the duodenum, together with these other juices, which will react with it. We can watch the stomach emptying using x-rays again. Collins Berry and Neal is now leaving his stomach. Watch the stomach wall squeezing the contents out. That's the top of the duodenum, like a mushroom at the top left. The stomach's connected to it by a narrow passage, the pylorus. There it goes. Now the barium meal's on its way to the rest of the digestive tract. The stomach's up here. We're now going to see what happens lower down. These are the intestines, about 30 feet of coiled up piping called a gut, pushed into quite a small space. First the food passes through the narrower, small intestines in the middle of the picture. Here it's happening, seen in x-ray film. The barium meal's been diluted by now, so its shadow isn't quite so clear, but you can see how the intestines, the piping, squeeze the stuff along in little spurts as the muscles in the gut walls contract. This process is called peristalsis. Food has to take a long, tangled path through this maze of coil tubing. Back to the model again. 
In the small intestine, digestive juices break food down further into simpler substances which can now pass into the rest of the body. The lining of the intestines is a bit like the pile of a carpet. There are lots of tiny fingers called villi sticking out inside. This is a magnified picture taken with an electron microscope. The dissolved chemical substances produced when the food is digested now pass through the thin walls of these villi into the blood vessels which they contain. Waste material, parts of the food which are of no use to the body, go on along the gut. This model doesn't show the blood supply, but what happens now is that the blood from the villi, carrying useful substances produced from the food, goes to this big and important organ, the liver, up by the stomach. Inside the liver, there's an enormously complicated network of blood vessels, and the dissolved substances from the digestive food pass from these into the liver cells, where all sorts of further chemical reactions take place, and they're turned into exactly what the body needs, the fuel, or for growing, or for replacing worn-out parts of the body. The liver's an immensely busy chemical factory, although, of course, it can only do its job if we've eaten the right kinds of food in the first place. So just to remind you, here's what happens again. There's the digestive tract with the intestines coiled up at the bottom end. And the liver. Chemical substances from the saliva and the stomach and the duodenum mix with our food and digest parts of it into simpler substances. These pass from the small intestines into blood vessels which carry them to the liver. In the liver, there are more chemical reactions than exactly the right fuels from carbohydrates and bodybuilding substances from proteins are manufactured and sent, dissolved in the blood, to where they're needed. For instance, fuel may be needed to provide energy to flex the arm. It passes in the bloodstream to the muscles of the arm, gets burnt, like the petrol in the motor car engine, and produces the energy the muscles need to work properly. And at the same time, the blood's carrying fuel and building material from the liver to every part of the living body. The waste part of our food, which the body can't make use of, passes from the small intestines to the large intestines, the large bowels round the outside. It passes first to the bottom of the ascending colon, part of which has been cut away on our model. Here there's the appendix, which can cause a lot of trouble if it gets diseased and maybe burst. The waste gets squeezed up the ascending colon. Across the transverse colon. And down the descending colon. As it does so, a lot of the water it contains passes through the bowel walls into the bloodstream. So that it's a sort of tasty solid, the feces, when it reaches the rectum at the end of the line. Here's an x-ray picture of the large intestines at the end of the digestive tract. Now, all that's valuable has been taken out from our food, and the feces are stored in the rectum until they're passed out through the anus, all that's left of the food we eat to keep us alive and active.